Here we go. Um, Kai, I saw that you had a question, and I, um, I, I presume that might have been for Katsumi, and I seem to have missed that. So we could we could start with that once we get everybody up. I would ask again that the speakers from the last session, if you don't, uh, the, the speakers this morning, if you don't mind, please unmute yourselves and and turn on your videos. That will let people um, address you directly if they have questions. Um, Kai, you had a, a, a question. Oh, uh, sorry. I, 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 was, I was in the classroom earlier. Uh, so uh, we know some Kumbang yeah. uh, My question <laughs> is, <laughs> since Monty Paris, uh, as you show in your, in your slide, that uh, they are found everywhere, almost, mm. is, uh, the distribution is much wider than Konobong. So what made the task group make such decision that uh, uh, focus on Konobong rather than Monte Paris or per per city cities. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I don't get the meaning. Ah, uh, before before Conomons was focused by the Tusca uh -huh. group, Monte Paris and uh, per 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 cities was uh, oh, was yeah, uh, yeah. was raised as boundary marker, yeah. And uh, uh -huh. as you show in your slides, Monte Paris has a much wider distribution than all other Conomons. So so why? <laughs> uh, but also, you have a wider distribution in some species of conodon, right? Mm. I, I just I talk know. about yeah. I just talk about the uh, the genus, not species. In this case, okay. yeah. So Montiparus, uh, as a genus, it has a wider distribution, and uh, if we have the true Montiparus from uh, uh, North America. That is a very big progress for correlating the uh, eastern and western hemispheres. But okay. the reason I, I I don't know exactly. <laughs> because it's it's a genus, and not a, a certain species. Yeah, In, yeah and the dispersion. And same story is also seen in other ge other genera like Fusulinera. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bidiaina also, okay. and uh, Tricetus, yes. I've got a couple of questions here. One uh, for the, the, I guess for the audience is um, Ron Martino. Uh, Ron, do you wanna go ahead and ask that question directly? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I'm, a, I'm not a, up on uh, the Conodont, uh, biostratigraphy in, in great detail, but in listening to the talks this morning uh, with uh, Roscoe and, and, and Barrick, uh, they talked about a widespread conodon extinction uh, just above the lost branch. And maybe this is obvious to, to the rest of you, but why is this marine event taking place at what appears to be the same time as the widespread lycopod extinctions on land, which are presumably uh, climate driven? I mean, what's going on in the oceans at this time, at the same time that the climate is changing, that might impact uh, the conodonts? Conodont folks. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, was hoping someone else would, I was hoping someone else would tell me what <laughs> climatic event or oceanographic event might uh, affect the conodonts. But it affects other marine organisms too. So I don't know. I didn't I, realize that it affected other marine organisms. So that's that. That was a new one for me. That uh, there was a large marine extinction at that boundary. Um, is Phil Heckel is still Phil? Do you 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 and I have talked about that in the past. Do you have some thought about that? Yes, uh, Howard Falcon Lang published uh, with a lot of co-authors, published a paper that I will mention tomorrow. And I think Howard is gonna be speaking uh, fairly soon himself. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the, one of the greatest of the regressions in the mid kind of Pennsylvanian cyclothem sequence succession takes place right after the Lost Branch uh, cycle and uh, the, 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 I'll be talking about this tomorrow. 
but uh, it took the sea, uh, the sea shoreline all the way down to central Oklahoma, whereas most of the other major cyclophen shorelines went down to the edge of the shelf in northern Oklahoma or southern Kansas. And, uh, it, uh, the, and it was preceded by another uh, very uh, uh, large regression of the sea. And then came the Lost Branch Cyclothem, uh, which extended quite a ways up on the shelf, not quite to the Appalachians. But then after that, it went down even farther. And, uh, and so the climate was cooling much more at the end of that. And that would have affected the lycopods. And the other thing is, is that the whole area for marine organisms, at least in the midcom, and, and one would expect on the rest of the world, was reduced to a point where a lot of marine genera went out as well, along with the lycopod uh, forest, uh, the arborescent lycopods. And, and, and your reproduction area in a steeper walled basin would have been greatly reduced with, with the lycopods as well. So I think it's the amount of regression that took place all over the world at that time, uh, much greater than that at the uh, current uh, Muscovian Casanovian boundary. So why would that affect marine nectonic organisms that produce the conodonts? I mean, wouldn't they just migrate well, to the ocean? <clears throat> Yeah, yes, but uh, but their but their whole area, at least in the shallow seas, are greatly reduced. And my guess is that, and I think uh, Jim Barrick mentioned this to me once, that that they they uh, they were not they were shallow sea dwellers. Uh, probably uh, uh, their 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 distribution was related to where they were in the uh, relative uh, oxygenation of the sea at least in the mid-continent. We don't see this elsewhere in the world. In other words, their whole, uh, their, their whole living area in shallow seas was greatly reduced at that particular point, more than any others that we see in the mid-continent. Further comment on that? Uh, we have uh, some paleobotanists here because there is a major turnover in the, in the terrestrial flora, not just not just the lycopods, it, it turns over a lot of other things as well. And there's a major change in dominance patterns in at least in coal that may not be um, so much in the compression floras, but there's a, a, within the coal swamps, you lose two thirds of the species. What's, what's it like in pollen, Cortland? Hey, Bill, you know, that uh, what Phil just said, you know, makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I'll be talking about on Wednesday um, it wasn't my work, but it was of Russ Peppers who looked at the palynology of the Lost Branch. And one of the things that struck me when I read the paper was just the, um, the amount of pteridosperm and gymnosperm, mainly conifer pollen, um, that is in the Lost Branch that we just don't see the equivalent of in the Appalachian section. So if that, you know, it, if that regression was as broad as, as Phil is mentioning, that might explain a lot of uh, what we see in the, you know, the, the reason for the, the conifers becoming so prevalent very, very late in the, uh, in the Asturian, in, in that part of the world. Um, and if, if that regression was not as broad in the Appalachian, that might explain why we don't see conifers moving in as rapidly and, and, and as abundantly. Um, it, you know, in the Appalachians, we, we, what happens is we see an expansion of other lowland flora coming in because all of a sudden there's this void left by the, the lycopods, the loss of the lycopods. And so we, we have kind of this, this, this mixed up zone. And then after that, the rest of the Casimovian, which is the lower part of our Connemaw formation, um, is essentially a, a tree fern dominant polyniflora with mixtures of admixtures of of calamites coming in to and supporting that. But both of those plant groups are are um, are, are are essentially lowland type plants. So um, I, I I appreciate Phil's comment there because it. It, it, it starts to make, you know, one of the reasons I, I've always been intrigued by Russ's paper on the Lost Branch because I can't identify it 
in the Appalachians, and I'm trying to identify it in the Illinois basin with some limited success, but it, it's going to take some more some more work to see if I can reproduce what he is um, what, what he came up with. The, you know, the the other thing, and again, I'll be talking about this Wednesday. You know, Russ and and myself have been essentially coal palynologists, okay, for most of our careers. I, you know, I, I finally am branching out and doing more clastic type sediment or palynology, but, you know, there, there, there is a difference when you start to compare coal palynofloras versus clastic palynofloras. There, there just is. And one of the things that I'm doing now is I'm, I'm going, uh, I have the, uh, a couple of drill core that go all the way through the Illinois basin part of the Pennsylvania. And I'm looking at the clastics now to refine some of the age relationships that, that Russ found with the coal, which, which are, are completely valid. But what happens is that when we start to compare these with other uh, more international schemes, which have coal and clastics, there's going to be a little bit of, of discrepancy in, in boundary placements. Thanks, Cortland. Sophia, you uh, sent a message. Uh, do you have, do you have a question, Sophia Makarovich? No? Sorry, I just accidentally entered in some characters from my keyboard. Oh. <laughs> just a mistake. <laughs> Okay, uh, Spencer, you wanted to uh, to raise uh, raise something. Go ahead. Let me ask. A, okay, let's go back to the marine extinction though. <clears throat> There's a big turnover in conodonts and and uh, fusilinids, but there is no big macro uh, faunal extinction in the marine realm. You lose Mesolobus, you lose a few ammonite genera, you lose Chytides, and that's all North American. I mean, does anybody know? Does Kaye know, or our Russian colleagues? Is there a similar turnover or loss in the marine macrofauna, you know, in, in the Tethian or Paleotethian realm? And how big of an extinction is that anyway? It's just a few genera going away. Anybody want to comment? You're gonna fall on that sword, Phil? What do you say? <laughs> uh, I suspect it has to do with the conodonts may have been more abundant in the shallower seas, and therefore a huge regression would make a difference. Whereas a lot of the brachiopods and those sorts of things, they're living at all levels of the uh, ocean and they might not have been uh, uh, affected as much, although they were in this one case in North America, very distinctively. Right, so that's why, you know, in the marine realm, it seems like it's a selective extinction once you get out of the microfauna, which is one reason nobody's ever really talked much about it. You don't have a paper about a, you know, a basal Casimovian marine extinction, <clears throat> right, once you leave conodonts and fusilinids. But the cold climate, and uh, I think Howard will come up with this, the cold climate will make a difference. In other words, the waters cooled a lot more because that was one of the greatest glacial uh, buildups in the Gondwana area <clears throat> based on how far sea level withdrew. And I even I think that Russ Peppers pointed out, I, I can't remember now, uh, but it's the, it, was, it was a colder climate everywhere. In other words, the, they built up the ice in Gondwana and the, uh, and the climate affected all the seas, all the shallow seas, or most of the shallow seas, even in the tropical areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Katie, you were going to comment? Yeah. Uh, about the South China, mm, about this uh, extinction event, as far as I know, there is uh, no research about it. And uh, the Conodon only discovered recently. The reason, I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting because the, the plant uh, the plant turnover, although it wasn't because the stratigraphy wasn't as good, was recognized. It was recognized that something happened there way back in the early 1900s. They just didn't have the correlations down well enough to, because the Missourian looks so much is so distinctive um, with macro fossils that you could really you knew you weren't in the in the middle of Pennsylvania. So, but they just didn't know where the boundaries were. So it's been 
not as honed down as this, yet I'd never heard of anything like that in the marine realm. Spencer, we also were hoping, Spencer and I were hoping to have a discussion among those of you who presented this morning and those who wish to comment on it about where the base of the Casamovian should go. If anyone cares to comment further on that, uh, the speak, ask the speakers, talk to the speakers, or speakers talk among you. Ask, um, let, let me ask. I mean, we, we've heard what Jim and Steve Roscoe think. Um, um, I, I think we know what Koyi thinks, but Koyi, can you weigh in on uh, after Jim and Steve's discussion, what's, what's your conclusion about placement of the base of the Casamovian? Uh, my opinion, only my personal opinion. Or your, um, your research conclusion, I guess. <laughs> well, my research, that is not uh, actually, that's not a conclusion, just based on the current knowledge we, which we know about the colonies. And if we, in the future, just, for example, we have found the lineage of Svatlina uh, Sapixelsa, and uh, if we found Sapixelsa in North America, mid-continent, so what we do? So that means the rating of Sapixelsa would be, would be like, uh, it's higher. So it has its potential. So I don't know. Uh, it's purely based on the current kind of knowledge we, we have now. And uh, for, for me, we don't have, in South China, we don't have such uh, regional stages and the colonies are all from the deep deep water sections. We don't have the cyclones. You know, at, at least for now, it's, it's, it hasn't detailed studied. So we followed the, we don't, you see, we, we, I didn't show any regional stages because that's a mini, meaningless. And the original stage, stages was established by the uh, shallow water fossils like uh, forums and uh, brachiopods. So we actually were following the North America and uh, and uh, Russian Russian platform chronology, chronostratigraphy scheme. And the conclusion is we don't. I don't have my personal. I don't have any preferences. I don't. If any species has correlation potential, then use it. And uh, Jim and Roscoe, uh, Steve Roscoe, they, have, they said, so the extinction of uh, sub, sub, uh, Swadlina is good for, for the correlation. Okay, I agree. But is that the extinction level is, is not equal to the first appearance of Hecli? No. If it is, then we use Hecli. Well, that would be all. No, uh, the first appearance of Hecali is actually a, a cycle up from the extinction of Suedalina in the mid-continent. So it doesn't actually line up perfectly uh, mm -hmm. here. What about, is Natalia still here? Um, what, what's the Russian point of view on all this? She not here? Okay. And what about, um, well now what about, let me ask Katsumi a question going back. Um, if, if you, Katsumi, if you were a Kanadot worker, you could see this in both Steve and Saeed's talk, you would want to know or think you know the lineage leading to Mon Monte Paris. You know that lineage? Is that lineage well established? Do we know what the ancestor descendant relationships are among Monte Paris species and its predecessor? Mm -hmm. So if we talk about the genus, the, the ancestor is easy, but the species is not so. And the problem is, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, it's not the story of Montiparis, but the story of Fuzurinera. The John Groove suggested a very interesting uh, uh, phenomena that uh, even uh, in Fuzurinera, uh, it is not, uh, uh, it is the polyphyletic. I mean, uh, uh, different ancestors evolved in, uh, in a very similar way into the Fuzurinera. So that uh, can be happened in, uh, in, in Fuzurinids. I don't, I, I don't know why. So it, it means that probably uh, even in the Montiparus, 
there are some uh, different lineages coming from the Protocetes and uh, evolving, evolving into Montiparus. Uh, I don't know why uh, such kind of things happens, but it's a kind of parallelism. And uh, that is very common in Fizunins. Mm -hmm. So that makes uh, uh, reconstruction of phylogeny and uh, also the identification taxonomy very difficult. And also uh, Fizunins uh, Benthic Forum, and uh, there are big questions about the interspecific variations interspecific variabilities. We only examine the five or 10 or 15 synfection specimens usually mm -hmm. and make a decision for, for identification. But uh, so if you compare the same, same named species from different areas, so you are probably surprising uh, because uh, there are very big variations and uh, you may not uh, believe they are the same species sometimes. Well, year, years ago, Cal Stevens, you know, Cal Stevens, mm -hmm. he, told, he told me if you go to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean today and you take a spoon and you take a spoonful of sediment, you will pick up maybe a hundred foram species in just this one spoonful. And do you think mm -hmm. that might be, if that's true now, it, could that have been true in the late Paleo <laughs> limits that they're just much more diverse this variation represents a huge diversity, not necessarily intraspecific variability. I have no idea in, in uh, periodic forums. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I mean, because, you know, I was talking to Cal about some of the American work on fusilinids which some people regard as oversplit. The taxonomy is too split. And this was mm -hmm. his justification. He says, you don't know it's oversplit because you look at modern foraminiferal diversity and it's very, very high. So why not have this huge diversity in the late Paleozoic? But in my opinion, the taxonomy of the North American Fizunit are much, much better than the Eurasian one. It's it, very confusing, in my opinion. The mm -hmm. Identification and the taxonomy of uh, some fusilid are very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, mm. yeah, I understand. So we don't have any. We we still don't have a Russian participant, right? Are they gone? I mean, I know Goryeva. She's not there. I, I yeah, thought. Yeah, she's. Yes, yeah, she is. She is here. So yes. can we? I would love to hear her talk. She about. Why, you know, where should the base of the Casimovian be? I gather from her talk, she thinks it should be at or very near the base of the traditional Casimovian, which is very different from the American point of view, perhaps. Natalia, are, are, are you there um, to uh, address some of Spencer's questions? I see her on the her on the screen. I, I believe her name is Cyrillic. So, no, okay. okay. Do yeah, we have yeah. it? Yeah. Do we have further comments? Anyone else want to weigh in here on anything? Uh, let me clarify my comment about the extinction of Suidolina. Again, some people obviously be uncomfortable of an extinction event, but I would just like to have, again, my preference to have the extinction of Suedolina be confined to the Muscovian and the boundary being placed either in something like the first occurrence of Idinothos Hecali or some other species, which is just above it with it again. So it would not have to be the extinction of Suedolina, but that's an event I think that should be occurring before uh, any major boundary is all. Well, how, um, I mean, I know they're a cycle apart what Steve said, but if I'm in a section that's more condensed, do I get the first Tekeli boom right above the extinction? I mean, are they pushed together in, in, in those sections so that, I mean, you know, cause you know, my philosophy is I want something we can correlate. 
Okay, to me, that's the best boundary, the most correlatable. And certainly if you have a big extinction, <clears throat> and a big appearance of all sorts of things, that's a good boundary to correlate, right? Let me mention something if it's okay. Sure. <clears throat> and that is that, that uh, the regression, which is called the seminal regression for this formation that goes all the way down to Southern Oklahoma, that it is so great that it's unclear whether there'd be any easily found place in the world where there'd be continuous sedimentation across that boundary. The reason I, I'll talk about this tomorrow, the reason I picked the next uh, top of the next minor cyclothem up is for that very reason. We want a continuous sedimentation. However, uh, most parts of the world where I've seen uh, stuff, and this is old, I haven't been looking as much since, but um, many, many places you will find eccentricus, heckeli, that sort of thing uh, in, the, uh, in the formation just above the last formation that has Suedolina or Bediana or those sorts of things in it, which means that in most places in the world, it's, uh, you don't even have that minor cycle that has got Missourian looking fossils in it, but is uh, uh, above the Des Moinesian, uh, I'm sorry, below, we had to put it below the, the Des Moinesian Missourian boundary because it was one of the few places we could find continuous sedimentation. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're gonna be hard to find because they're not there in Oklahoma. And that's why, I mean, Oklahoma is the basinal area and, uh, and the, the, there's tree trunks at that level down in, uh, at Ada, Oklahoma, which is uh, the bottom of the basin, as far as we can tell. Well, what about at Naching, where apparently you have a deeper water succession? That would be uh, for our Chinese colleagues, and I think they're probably looking for it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in, in Naching section, it's, uh, the situation is like this. We have a Hecli in a certain bed and uh, the other condoms, Swadlina, Swadlina and other older Idognathodes, they still survived above, just a little bit above the first appearance of Hecli. But I think it would be reasonable. In the situation in the mid Carboniferous boundary, uh, they pr previously they thought that uh, older Mississippian species get extinct below the, below the mid Carboniferous boundary. And actually, it's not that. In the deep water section in Spain, Cantabrian Cantabri and Euros and South China, some older Mississippian Ganatodos and a lot Korea, they across the mid Carboniferous boundary. I think it's reasonable. Bill? Herman. Yeah, actually, I wanted to point out something that was discussed earlier, namely what the productivity on land has an influence on the ocean, because the nutrients that the plants create flows in part into the ocean and feeds what's happening in the ocean. So if there is a major change on land, we will also see a change in the ocean. I mean, the main fishery areas today are where large rivers take nutrients into the ocean. So right. in other words, this connection is quite clear. Right, and that, but Herman, that would be pretty much just in shallow waters, right? I mean, it wouldn't affect the global ocean necessarily, or would it, in your mind? It, it would be stronger in the shallow ocean, but it would ultimately uh, influence the entire ocean. So Herman, are you saying that the, the changes on land would, um, uh, would result in greater runoff or, or something like uh, that? Gr greater nutrient input if you have a major extinction. If there, are dead, at, if there are dead plants lying around, the, some of that will flow into the ocean at a higher amount than under regular circumstances. There's a constant input from land into the ocean. The land flora feeds the ocean. That's ongoing and has been ongoing since there was, were plants on land. Right. Would there be expected to be some sort of an isotopic signature of this at that boundary, would you think? If it's isotopic, I don't know. It would be volume, increase in volume at that point. 
The, the question I would ask related to that then is, but what is the nature of the plant turnover? It's not like a big die off uh, that dumps a huge amount of uh, organic and it would have a different carbon signature for sure into the shallow oceans. Isn't it just the, I mean, let me ask you this. If I was in the uh, Moscovia and Casimovian or Des Moines and Missouri in interval, would there be so, just as much ground cover before and after the plant event or it, did the nature of ground cover really change? That's a good question. I mean, the uh, uh, Lycopsids were very large plants. The uh, ferns that essentially took over dominating would be much smaller plants. So the, the question is if that influenced the biomass, but this, at, there should be at least a spike at the time uh, we had the die off. Mm -hmm. I think it's time transgressive to some extent too, isn't it? Some of the things that disappear in North America continue in, in European basins. Um, uh, they continue in uh, China, not in Europe. In Europe, we have the principally largely the same die off of the Lycopsids. In China, no, there uh, it continued. Well, I think one of the, um, this is a good setup for tomorrow because tomorrow we have people talking primarily about climate and glaciers and all of the physical parameters that are, we think are driving, you know, we have the biotic change, but we wanna look towards some climate change or something like this to drive this. So this, this is good. I think we may get to, um, we may get more insight into this tomorrow from, from people like John Isbell and and Oregon and all that when we talk about uh, climate and these kinds of changes. Because there's obviously something happening in the marine and the non-marine realm. What impresses me about it is it's selective to some extent. It's not a pervasive, it's not like the end of the Permian when we think all sorts of things mm -hmm. go away. Mm -hmm. And it's also got evident diachroneity. You know, uh, it sounds like in China, the suede alina don't all go extinct before Hecali. Some of them didn't know, they didn't know they were supposed to go extinct. Yeah. They, lived on, they lived on into the, which is fine. That's the way extinctions work, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we know now that, you know, we thought mammoths went extinct at the end of the last ice age. We now know they lived on islands near Siberia till 4,000 years ago. So refugia, you know, the survival of a big extinction, maybe China is a refugium, South China for, for suede alina. John Knight, you've, you've appeared. Uh, yeah, could, uh, uh, thanks, Philip. I, uh, I'm online now, am I? Uh, I, I bet I'm most interested in the, um, the, the point made by Herman, uh, which I think is very valid. But I think from the European point of view, we should remember two things. One is that uh, this interface was a period of great orogenic turnover. Uh, what was happening within uh, Europe at the end of the Verisk and Orogeny, uh, and the uh, segmentation of basins uh, was quite significant, which would also have had a significant effect both on runoff and on uh, plant cover. Coming back to the, uh, the presence of the Lycopsids, uh, it's interesting to note that traditionally, one of the big comments about the floor of the Stephanian A in the Saint Etienne Basin uh, made by people like Dubonjou, was that uh, it was still remarkable for the high presence of lycopsids. And we do know in parts of Spain that uh, there's a very high presence of, of lycopsids within some of the coal-bearing coal uh, units. But we should remember that we're on the other side of, of, of the Risk, the Bersken orogenic belt. Uh, we're in the Paleo uh, Tethys area. And I think some of the differences that we're seeing, probably with a time lapse, uh, reflect uh, that feature. And it, uh, it, it will be, I think, significant, the, uh, the, the relative position of the uh, sedimentary basins that we're talking about through this interval. Yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the world is a huge place, right? I mean, and we, it's easy to forget when you put a Scotese or a Blakey map up and there you just see a few dots, you kind of forget that we're, we're talking things that are thousands of kilometers apart, even back then. You know, they're not, they may not be as far apart back then as they were. And uh, I guess then the other problem, I, you know, I mean, my take always on the paleobotany is it's all very sensitive to climate, perhaps more so than anything. I mean, to what extent, if it gets cold, you know, like Phil, you were talking about, okay, we have a big ice age, it gets cold. Um, how much does the ocean buffer that cold versus the air? Doesn't it get more cold or more importantly cold? out in the air than it does in the water, at least initially, at least early? It would probably get colder in the shallow seas than the deeper seas. Mm. Yeah, that I would agree with, yeah, absolutely. But I just wonder if the terrestrial effects are actually more dramatic than the marine effects of this climate event. There's also the preservational effects uh, in the terrestrial realm, which are becoming more, more apparent. I think of the work Hans Kerp and his group have been doing in Jordan, where they're finding uh, just increasing numbers of, you know, not huge numbers, but large enough to be noteworthy of plants that were previously thought only to exist in the Mesozoic, some of them mid-Mesozoic, groups that the charistosperms that were thought to be indicative of, of Southern Gondwana during the late Triassic and Jurassic have shown up in Jordan, which is equatorial in the late Permian. So and there are many other examples of things showing up millions of years earlier on land. So it's the, the preservational environment on land is really restricted and it, it, it leaves you missing first. I mean, I wouldn't trust first occurrences on land at all. Uh, there, there's, unless they're lowland plants by nature. So if you're dealing with, like if you're gonna do stratigraphy, it's really hard to do stratigraphy with plants that grow in climates that aren't well represented or that likely grew in, in elevated areas because you don't see them, or at least not often enough to be confident. I think the marine realm may not suffer from that, that particular problem as much. I mean, I don't want to, don't want to bash my own area of work, but, but it's uh, the terrestrial realm leaves, depends what you want to do with it. You have to be, you have to, you have to understand how to handle terrestrial data because of the fact that you can be missing um, large amounts of material. Right, well, I think we all, we all know, I mean, a priori, the marine record is thought to be first order more complete, which is why we base time scale on it. You know, we're not, we're not trying to define the Casimovian using plants or reptiles or something like this. But nonetheless, I'm impressed by, there's a lot of gaps in the marine record too. And that's why, you know, like if you go back to Natalia's talks and she's not gonna speak, if you look at that type uh, Casimovian section, I mean, to me, that, that's, um, it's very thin. It's got a lot of facies changes. The base of the type Casimovian looks like an unconformity to me on the top of the Mos Moscovian. And then what happens? The first uh, Suedalana subexcelsa isn't even at the base of the Casimovian in her, in her diagrams. If you looked carefully, you don't get Suedalina subexcelsa to a few meters or whatever it is above that base. Yet they draw the zone as if it goes all the way down to the base, which may not be a bad extrapolation, but it is an extrapolation nonetheless. And then you, <clears throat> that's why I asked you that question too. To me, if I go to Naqing and you're showing me conodonts from grain stones, pack stones, and wacky stones, those are three different faces right off the bat. Now, and I would wonder, and I do wonder, how different the Conodon assemblages might be simply because of faces. So, you know, it's a, it's a question of magnitude, I guess. The magnitude of the problem, what you're talking about, Bill, is certainly greater in non-marine rocks, but I don't, it still exists in the marine realm. And that's why, you know, Phil's comment is really good. Maybe there's no complete record almost anywhere of this transition, Des Moines, Missouri, and whatever you call it, the equivalent, simply because of this enormous regression that occurs at that point. I mean, you know, one thing I've wondered about since I'm, a, I, I'm what I call, I call myself a timescale junkie, is I've often wondered, will we ever really find a complete rock record of all Phanerozoic time? Or is it possible that there are places where we don't have a complete record within the Phanerozoic anywhere? You know, there may be gaps that are never going to be filled. 
Well, I I would agree with you that, that uh, there is no complete record in, in some in some sense. In the 19th section, although it is a deep water section, but of course it's influenced by the by the glaciation or the sea level uh, sea level rise or down, of course. And the, we have noticed that the fauna um, they have they have shown a pattern of uh, selective preservation. For example, for instance, in some beds they are almost idognathodus, and in some beds they are almost swadlina. So yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I have a question for Ke Yi. Ke Hu. Yeah. Ke Yi Hu. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I have seen that section at Nashui, and it is uh, beautifully uh, 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 tilted so that you can get the entire Carboniferous in one big long road cut. And, but my understanding is, and I, would, I was on a, a good field trip there a number of years ago, and there are platform tops where there's definitely uh, paleosol breaks between the limestone units. But this is a, is this a bottom of a basin, the side of a basin? So many of the reasons for the difference in lithologies in the succession, if it's a slope succession off these high uh, carbonate banks, uh, the, the difference in the uh, lithologies is just a difference of the amount of debris or where the debris came from that went down the slope. So it's not a difference in a major difference in environment. It's just a difference in the uh, amount of energy that would it take to get uh, fossil fragments down versus mud. Yeah, probably. Because in, in the debris, for, for instance, we, we call the greenstone, actually they are, they are wood. you can find uh, forums there. And in the mudstone or the wacky stone, you cannot. So probably this energy caused the, the trans transformation from the, uh, from, the, from the shore, whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. But there's no evidence of paleosols or any nope. exposure surfaces anywhere. That's what I noticed when I was there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it is a more complete section than any other place. <laughs> yes, it is. But uh, I still, there's, it's, it's not perfect, but uh, it's uh, probably the most uh, complete in yes. all, all around the world. I agree. Yeah, thank you, Pierre. <laughs> Sasha, Alexiev, you have a, a comment? Hi, everybody. Um, oh, Sasha. You. Um, in Moscow Basin, the uh, most uh, important change in uh, uh, sediment accumulation and uh, marine uh, microfauna is the uh, Moscovian Kosimovian boundary. Of course, it coincides with the gap. But anyway, the top of uh, Moscovian is key formations demonstrate the last occurrence of uh, Neognitodus from Conodons, very important guy in Bashkirian and Moscovian interval. And at the, the same time, um, the last occurrence of uh, marine Demospondian catetids. But the uh, Swade line across this boundary. In uh, US mid-continent, we have also very close situation when the uh, extinction level of uh, neognitodus and catetids at the same level, but Swade line extinct together with them. Yes, uh, I, I don't know <laughs> what this uh, event is uh, <laughs> synchronous <laughs> uh, because two taxa uh, extinct at the same level in very distant regions. Looks like that's more important event for the large distant correlation than Svadelina extinction because it's only one axon. Yes. Anyway, Sasha. at this boundary, we feel that uh, marine basin uh, became much more uh, higher salinity. Last years, 
one uh, my colleague from geological institute found in a small crystals of quartz inside them uh, the crystals of barite uh, then um, fluoride and uh, other um, minerals which are typical for the uh, high salinity environments they preserved inside of uh, quartz precipitations and we see that uh, this uh, level this time uh, reflects uh, the very serious aridification in the middle of russian platform and even in uh, donetsk basin that uh, very uh, very good uh, shown by uh, <clears throat> Ukrainian paleobotanist, uh, the, more or less this level coincide with the shift from the um, wet flora to the dry flora, and more and more uh, aridification uh, signatures in a sedimentation succession. Um, I don't know what is the reason for this, but uh, it could be climatic, worldwide climatic changes, but I'm not sure that this um, climate became more colder than previously, than in Moscovian time, in Kasimovian. But uh, anyway, uh, very serious uh, environmental changes occurs at this boundary. Um, my opinion that uh, for uh, Eastern European platform, the base of Kasimovian Kasimovia is the uh, uh, best choice for the <coughs> base of this stage, Kasimovian stage, I mean. It's uh, easy to recognize it much easier than Hakele. Hakele is very nice species, but uh, the set, uh, the same time, I see uh, many di difficulties how to identify it because it's uh, intermediate uh, morphotype between two also relatively close species, conodon species. Uh, up to now, I don't uh, understand how to identify it <laughs> relatively. Uh, easy for the boundary marker very important to be easily recognizable if it's uh, only <coughs> minor <coughs> characters it's very difficult could be um, uh, different specialist uh, will uh, <laughs> identify it at the different levels and, uh, yes okay. uh, Sasha uh, I remember on one of those great field trips that you led to the Moscow area that uh, you showed me in the Pesky quarry a paleosol and uh, separating two of the limestone units. And was Pavel Kabanov your student? Um, Kabanov uh, left Moscow, Moscow 10 years ago and he's yes. in uh, Canada, in yes. Calgary. Yeah, and uh, stopped his studies. Right, but didn't he study the paleosols between the major marine units in the uh, in the Moscow area from Moscovian into uh, perhaps Gajelian? And he showed that there was many, many breaks in sedimentation there, like there are in the mid-continent US. And so if a boundary is to be drawn, no matter what it's drawn on, it'll have to be drawn in an area of more continuous sedimentation. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. But uh, very shallow water environments uh, yeah. in central Moscow basin, and we uh, every maybe two meters, five meters, ten meters, new mm -hmm. new paleosol and the new new uh, gaps. Uh, with uh, sometimes we don't we cannot idea um, maybe. Uh, how, how many uh, cycles missed at this uh, unconformities? We don't know. 
No. But we have information about the core core intervals. Yes. Yes. For the relatively long distance correlation, but uh, we cannot to establish exact boundary. Mm -hmm. We cannot to find a first uh, origins of species or something like, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we've come to an hour pretty much of discussion, um, which is what we'd scheduled. You've all been here for a long time and it's late uh, in parts of the world right now. Um, so um, I'd like to bring this to an end if we could, uh, and we'll continue again tomorrow um, at the same time in the morning for uh, those of you who plan to be here. Um, I would appreciate it if um, my management team would stay on the meeting uh, for a little while so we can uh, uh, download some stuff and talk about how we're gonna handle things tomorrow. But the, for the rest, I appreciate everyone who's taken the time to be here today. I think this has been really, for me, very, uh, very enlightening, very educational. Uh, it's, it's shown me things I did not know about before. And I really appreciate the excellent talks and what everyone's done. Thank you all very, very much for contributing and for asking questions. And uh, it's, just, it's been a really good first day. So I thank everyone and you can go do whatever you need to do next. Go to bed, have a cup of coffee, do, do whatever. <laughs> okay, everyone. Thank Thanks you. to all of you. Bye. Bye everyone.